The, the foundation of what I do rests on perception that you can have the best reality in the world, you can have the best product, but unless you're marketing your perception, me, it matches that, then you know nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna happen for you. This is Stay Paid, the marketing podcast that gives listeners a competitive edge to stay motivated, find inspiration, and discover proven real world tactics from some of the best marketers across the nation. Welcome to Stay Paid. My name is Joshua Steik, along with Luke Acri, and our guest today is Kostya Kimlat. Uh, first, by the way, because Kostya is a magician. Yes, magician. Yeah. Very cool. Kostya is I'm a world-renowned sleight-of-hand magician and motivational keynote speaker who fooled the famous magic duo Penn & Teller on their TV show Fool Us and became the closing act for their show at the Rio in Las Vegas. He's performed in over 200 cities on five continents. Known as the business magician, he has taught employees at GE, Morgan Stanley, and NASA how to think like a magician to improve their customer service and communication. In 2020, Kostya pivoted his business and now has uh, performed for tens of thousands of people in a virtual setting. Kostya, welcome to Stay Paid. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Real pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. Yeah, it is awesome to have you on the show. I want to dive right in. I want to talk about, like, how do you help businesses by teaching better them, magicians. Yeah, to no. <laughs> teaching them to think like a magician. Like, and let's just focus real quick on the service side, right? Because service is everything in, in business. So what, what does that actually mean to ha think like a magician to help your service in your business? Yeah, the, the first thing that people think of when they think of a magician is they think it's all about deception. And so the very first thing I tell my audience up front is that for me, magic is not about deception, but it's about perception. And so for me, the art of magic didn't turn, it, it went from like, oh, fun hobby to, you know, how I'm making a living. But what I really realized over time performing at corporate events was that it wasn't about the magic performances. It was about the audience interaction. It was about the psychology getting into their heads. And so slowly I started making these connections over 20 years now doing this between sales and customer service and the things that great magicians do in order to create an alternate reality in the eyes of their audience. And so the, the foundation of what I do rests on perception that you can have the best reality in the world, you can have the best product, but unless you're marketing your perception, me, it matches that, then you know nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna happen for you. And so some people get upset because they have uh, the greatest reality, but the worst uh, perception and vice versa. So you gotta have both. You gotta have the best reality of the product and the greatest perception. So I help people see things from their customer's point of view, from their audience's point of view. And, and to think differently about what it is that they do. Talk about the difference, because we actually interviewed you in our magazines that we that we publish here at Reminder Media. One of the things that really stood out to me was this difference between the juggler and the magician in business. And explain what you mean about that. Yeah, you know, everyone is very busy, right? We're all very busy doing things in our lives. And, and when I ask my, my audiences, right, whether I'm talking to employees or to clients, I ask them to think about their audience. I ask them to think how they're perceived by their audience and whether they're perceived as a juggler or as a magician. And the difference is that the juggler will spend decades practicing to show off their skills, whereas the magician, I have to practice same amount of time, same decades to hide my skills. Hmm. And so the difference is that most people go around thinking like showing off, look how busy I am, look how many uh, tables I have at the restaurant, look, look, I have so many patients. But customers and clients and patients don't care how busy you are. They don't want to see you as a juggler. They want you to create pure magic for them. And so that's kind of one of the steps of thinking like a magician is breaking out of that juggler mindset and not showing off your method and instead focusing on the perceived effect that you're creating for the people. Yeah, it's so good. How do you do that tactically? Like, what are some of the things that you're coaching people on in just the day-to-day -day sort of activities or, or the tactical piece of being able to provide that service without, you know, showcasing it, I guess? Yeah, a part of it is that most of the time people are so focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. They're so busy on who they are and what they have going on. And so, again, you know, I started off with food service training and customer service. So that, that was the, just a the little line I gave a second ago, which is, hey, I have so many tables, right? Anytime we're busy, we want to tell everyone how busy we are. The doctor wants to tell his patients, oh, you know, we're, my office is all booked up today. Well, they don't care about that. So the first step, the tactical step, is to realize whether you or your employees are so focused on the methods that you're so obsessed about, the, the systems and the processes that your clients don't actually care about. Mm. And so I, I take my clients through a process of perceptual management where we really look at what are all the perceptual transactions? How are people interacting with you, your store, your brand, your company? And then we look at whether those match the ideal effect you're trying to create. And then we work backwards to figure out what training and what systems need to be in place for that. 
Yeah, it's so interesting. When did you uh, make this connection? Like, obviously, you were doing magic for a really long time. It starts out as a passion, I'm sure. I'm sure it still is. But when did you make the transition, and how did that occur to actually use it in business and the motivational speaking side? Yeah, I, it was very early on, and because magic taught me to pay my dues and to study, and I had mentors who were many, many years older than I, many decades, I did the same thing in business. So when I started, I didn't tell anyone I was a speaker or trainer for a good 10 years. It took me how long to develop like what wow. I was talking about, what's the content, what's the ideas, and working slowly with clients in Central Florida before branching out nationwide. And what, what happened was really simple, is I was hired as an entertainer, as a magician, to speak at a sales meeting when I was like 19, 20 years old, and I was so nervous, I showed up super early, and I sat in the back of the room just to like take it in, you know, get a sense for who the audience is gonna be, how they're gonna act. And I was fascinated. Here's how a Fortune 500 company runs their business, here's how they motivate their team, here's how they do their planning. And so I realized that this was a cool opportunity, and I started being in the room whenever I could be, started learning from my clients, and then being able to, to get up on stage and, and connect what I was saying with everything that had come before of that day's conference, the other speakers, the other sessions. And so I was learning, but I was also connecting the dots for them in a ways that they wouldn't. So they, they're like, we need to bring you in to close the speech every time because you're helping us see the dots and provide actionable things we can do together. And uh, so that's how I got into the corporate world and just continued learning and learning. My degree's in philosophy. So I am, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a, I'm a thinker, I'm an entrepreneur, but business to me slowly became an art. And whereas a lot of my fellow artists and magicians kind of, they shun the, the business side of it. I embraced it because I didn't want to be a starving artist. I, I thought it was unfair how some of the best magicians in the world I knew were terrible at business, so they were starving artists. And, and some of the you know, people who do corny and cheesy magic tricks, they're doing 15 birthday parties a weekend and they're killing it. And I was like, okay, so being good and being successful are two different things. They require two different approaches. And, and that, that was the foundation of me really focusing on the business side and then slowly developing the content over the last 20 years. Yeah, it's like, it's so funny, man. When you think about it, it's like everybody thinks of overnight successes. And I'm reminded of like Jeff Foxworthy and they were interviewing him one time. They're like, man, you're like the next, you're the overnight success, this comedian. And he's like, oh, you mean, you know, the overnight of the 900 radio interviews I did for the last you know, two and a half years, the, you know, countless nights in these no name clubs, no name, nobody's showing up. And it's like, there's no overnight success. It takes refining. You talk about these two different tracks, right? In business of like the, the starving artist and then the one who's successful and the differentiation there. And I want to dig a little deeper on your thought process of how to market a business. You have a super unique business to market. You're a mag magician and a business like motivational speaker, trainer type idea. How do you think about marketing a business? Because we have a lot of real estate agents that are clients. We, we have a lot of service-based, I call them like local professionals that are clients. If you were giving advice to them on how to market their business effectively where they stand out, versus all of these other agents that are in the local area. What are, where does your brain go in that? Yeah, the, the, there's two really approaches that I can take. You know, one is kind of, I can give you the advice that I do as just my own business that uh, applies to me as magic, but certainly because of the uniqueness of it, it's taken a different approach. And for the longest time, I thought I was going to be, you know, a local unknown magician with a very successful business, but I would never be famous. I'd never be on TV. And I was very happy with that. I was very content because I knew that I love magic. Magic brings people joy. Their joy brings me joy. I want to do that for the rest of my life. So it was, first of all, kind of accepting what I was happy with and knowing that that was a great foundation. Mm. That eased all of the tension. That eased any of that anxiety of, you know, am I good enough? Am I going to succeed? All, the, all these things. And of course, goals are great. I'm not talking about that. But in general, I first figured out what's the lifestyle that I want, what was I happy with, what were the important things in my life, and magic aligned with that. It didn't, I didn't have to be successful. Uh, I had to be successful enough for me. And so then, thanks to Penn and Teller putting me on their TV show, they, they catapulted uh, my career, and, and I became known nationally, and they changed things around, uh, and they created that kind of success, kind of un, un, like unparalleled success, because I learned that I can spend years and years 
marketing my services, doing a great job, getting repeats and referrals, but it was nothing like getting on someone else's platform where millions of people will see you. Mm. And, and so, so I have kind of two pieces of advice. One is the slow and steady track. And the other one is what is so outlandish? What is something that is a, a reach for you? Something that you don't think you could do, but that would multiply your audience in ways you've never could imagine before. And who already has the audience that you do? And how can you reach those people? One of the things that I did during the pandemic when I pivoted my business was I partnered with several businesses and I helped them reach virtual audiences. Everyone was home for the first time. No one knew how to present virtually. And what I found in generating business was creative ways of finding a furniture manufacturer and furniture store that would then bring their customer list together and we would do a virtual performance for all of them. Oh, wow. And nothing was going to happen. The customers who bought at that store were not going to hear from the store. The customers from the furniture manufacturer were never going to hear from them. But now they had thousands of their customers that came together. They sent out an email saying, hey, we have a gift for you. We're going to do a virtual magic show. This is the pandemic. You're staying home. And that allowed those two businesses to generate business at a time when nothing was happening. That's incredible. So, so that's, that's kind of the, first, the that's the suggestions is, is pair up with someone who already has the audience that you do and, and you'll find ways of multiplying your reach. Um, the other way is the slow and steady way, which is to do an incredible job, repeat and referrals. And I think that my advice for anyone who's a local business owner who's doing that is to think like a big business owner, kind of like the E-Myth Revisited, where you're really thinking of your one business as if you were multiplying it a thousand times that forces you to elevate your level of performance. And then if you think about, well, what are all the ways that people interact with me from the phone call, from the website, from my business card. And if you make a list of all those perceptual transactions, then you can work to elevate every one of those. So you stand out. I do a magic trick with my business card for 25 years. I've been doing it. I came up with it as a teenager. <laughs> I, I it was the greatest, I, it's the greatest way of generating business. And every time someone asks me for a business card, Instead of just getting a piece of paper, they get an incredible story and a physical memento of that story to share and tell. That's, That's awesome. how a change of, uh, of the transaction kind of to make it memorable. And you can do that through every touch point that you have in your business. It's just hard work over time mm -hmm. to be honest with yourself and see yourself from your customer's point of view. So that's a lot of me rambling, but that, those are two, two ideas. That's really good. Yeah, powerful stuff. Yeah. When was the first time you went on? Because I know you went on a couple of times on, on Penn & Teller. Yeah, I went on, on their second season. That was the first time they came from the UK to America. Their mentor was a magician named Johnny Thompson. And he reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to be on the show? I, I love Johnny so much. Any chance to spend with him? I said, yes. I did not think I was going to fool Penn & Teller. Um, so what I did, and this is maybe just another business lesson, is that I had this chance to be on TV to showcase what I do, but I have no control over what's going to happen, how it's going to look, how it's going to be perceived. The only thing that I have control over is the first 30 second introduction where they interview me. So when they interviewed me for that show, I made sure to stay focused around my business as a magician. Mm. And so many of my friends and colleagues were talking about their, you know, how they got started in the magic, what their favorite trick was, wonderful things. But I knew this is the only thing that I can control. And so I spoke specifically about my business and that ended up being a 30 second commercial seen by millions and millions of people online and offline Smart. before the trick. Yeah, it's so brilliant. And that was, it was the greatest difference in business. That, that <laughs> one made everything. So, so how did you, you said know, you didn't think you'd fool them. How did you fool them? Yeah, I did a trick at that point. I didn't even know, but I did a trick for them that they had done on the Today Show a week prior. Wow. So, Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I did a trick. You know, in, in magic, there's a method and an effect. Those are the two sides to every trick. And those are the two sides to every business. That's a big, big chunk of what I talk about with businesses is your method is what you work on to yep. hide, just like the, the magician, right, versus the juggler. And the effect is the perceptions that you create in the audience's mind. Hmm. So this effect, 100 years old, as soon as I started, they're like, oh, we know what he's doing. Okay, great. We're going to bust him. And then halfway through, they realize that all the methods that they know, I was not doing I had set up, you know, things for them to think about. And then halfway through, that's why they got really mad. Penn picks up a chair, goes nuts <laughs> because they thought they had me. And then halfway through, they're like, he's not doing anything we know. And so um, 
uh, Penn was very kind. He, he wrote a forward for, for a book that I've been working on, and in it he talks about how the reason that I fooled them is because I don't just think like magicians, but I thought like Penn and Teller. Oh, wow. I really got in their heads visually, placing them where to sit, psychologically. Every movement and every word that I used, audience won't even realize it, but there's subtext and, and layers there to mess with Penn and Teller because I know what they know. And, and so that's what I do with every audience. And I think that anyone who's, how do you, thanks. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, how do you do that? Like, how, like, um, <laughs> do you, is it research beforehand? Like, uh, can a business owner do this or a salesman that's selling a product do this? Like get in the head of somebody by knowing things about them, like any tips you can give on that? Yeah, let, let's, let's dive into that. Cause that, th- this is a huge, well, uh, you know, there's, there's two things you can do for one, for any salesperson that's going into a meeting, whether it's virtually on zoom or in person, you're going in to, to speak to one, two or three people. The most important thing is to find out who's going to be there and find out as much as you can about them. Most importantly, what you want to learn is their personality style, whether they're the type of person that wants facts and details, whether they want stories and emotions. So the, you know, Disc and Myers-Briggs, I, I teach a version of that as a magician. But for me, it's not all about getting your, you know, 26 page printout of Myers-Briggs and being like, here's who I am. For me, a core skill is meeting people in a sales and service environment and within 30 seconds, knowing who they are in the moment, how they're acting, their social style, and what it is that they need from our interaction. Hmm. And everyone needs something different. And even in magic, when I approach a group, I'll have two, three, four, five people with two, three different personality style. One wants to take control, one wants attention, recognition, one wants just support, one wants to be left alone. And my job, is to deliver my competency statement, which is my opening statement, something that I've done thousands of times identically. And as I say to the audience or the group, as I start the meeting or start the magic show, I can now sense how they're responding and reacting because I've done the same thing a thousand times plus. And now I see, okay, great, you're the analytical person. You're going to need facts and figures. Hey, you're the driver. You're going to need to take control, what I call the spade, right? So I got a spade. I got two diamonds that love the attention. I got an analytical club. So preparing for any meeting, virtually or in person, is all for me about finding out who the personalities are, what they need. And then if I can, having meetings ahead of time to know what their base of knowledge is. This is a magic secret. In order for me to fool you, I don't have to do the hardest trick. I just have to do something you don't know. Mm. So if I know what my audience knows, and I can just go beyond that, I can then fool them with a magic trick. And so in sales, you may know a ton of things about your product. You have experience of 10, 20 years of selling it and owning your company. But this person is hearing it from the first time. So you have to know what do they know, what do they not know. You can't unload everything you know about your product and service without taking the time to understand what their knowledge and their perception is and their level of interest and their awareness and attentions. And so there's all these that wonderful so things going good, on in the dude. social dynamic. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is a great golden nugget. Do you pick up off of like body language, the way someone's dressed? Um, I went through a training one time that they were trying to teach you the personality types visually by the way people dress and their tone of voice and like whether they smile when they engage and stuff like that. And, and it was pretty effective. Is that what you're referring to for like when you're giving your opening, you're watching like this person is dressed this way and this person, like a perfect example would be someone who has like uh, maybe like uh, purple hair or blue hair. This is an obvious example. Or but no they're, hair. They're going to be... Let's not forget about no They're going to be a more... Yeah, no hair. <laughs> they're going to be like a creative type, a more free spirit type. Like, you know, they're going to be more artsy and more um, like they, they don't care about the rules as much. Now, that's a really simplification, right, of what I'm talking about. But is that how you're referring to, like when you're giving your opening statement, you're looking at all those things? Yeah. So th- those things are, are wonderful. And I also want to say we have to be careful when we study those things because many of them are, c- can be a pseudoscience okay. where it's very easy for us to, to believe things that aren't scientifically proven because they feel right. So I think it's very easy um, 
for for those so those kinds of ways of judging people and uh, magicians especially right it's easy for me to create the illusion that i know if you're lying or telling the truth i can create the illusion that i'm reading your body language and i can do it very convincingly so i have to be very careful in in telling my audiences that i'm not here to pretend that i have any magical powers however there is a 100 truth that simply the act of paying attention to other people is is the greatest tool that you can have in sales and customer service. So to your point of someone with a purple hair, well, sure, right? Because if they're doing something that makes them stand out, they want to be acknowledged. Mm. They want people to say those things. But it can be much more subtle things. So yes, body language, dress, all those things matter. Voice, the things they respond. There's really two things that I look for to identify a personality style, and that's their speed and their temperature. Mm. So, so those are the factors for me is, are they warm or are they cold? Which tells me if they're like a red suit or a black suit. And then are they fast or are they slow? And if they're fast, they're like diamonds or spades or sharp. And if they're like taking their time and they're slow and relaxed and they're warmer, their hearts, or if they're like got their arms crossed and they're speaking slowly and they're you know, looking at me like this, then I know they're a club. They're taking their time and analyzing me. So those are the two things I look for. It's freaking gold. And if I can... What's that? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's absolutely to me. That's everything, and um, and and then I know based on those things, based on their personality, not everything about them, but I know who they are in the moment. I know mm. what they want in the moment as a customer, and and so that's what I teach. You know, all the corporations that bring me in, they've already done Myers Briggs and DISC training. They know mm. about the personality style, but most of them know about themselves. They don't know how to do it quickly with the person they meet. And that's a really great tool that I can teach them as a magician that naturally evolved over the years of me doing trade shows and conferences. My clients would ask me, like, how do you pull a crowd? How do you win all these people over? And they're so different. So so that's that's a part of what I do. Do you tailor? um, So I'm just so curious about this stuff. Do Do you tailor the talk? Like, obviously, you can't make your talk super analytical because you're only talking to the clubs, right? Or you can't make it too super feel good. You're only talking to the hearts type idea. So do you tailor your interactions is what you're tailoring and you keep your overall topic the same? So I, I just got done speaking on a stage not too long ago. And, you know, there's like a thousand people in the room. And it's like, okay, how do I become a better presenter? Is it in my engagement with the audience? I'm reading that one person on the front row. And maybe it's not a thousand people, right? Maybe it's 50 people or whatever. But it's like, I'm reading that one person. I tailor my my example to them in a certain way. Um, or do you keep it kind of high level and you're just reading in the way you kind of acknowledge them? Great question. I definitely practice what I preach. And in that... I adjust my magic whenever I approach a group. If it's a small group and I'm doing interactive magic, I approach my style. If I go into a Zoom meeting, my client tells me, you know, I meet with one person, they're really excited about bringing me in. Hey, we're going to meet with the rest of the team. Tell me a little bit about them. I write down, I know who they are, and I just identify what kind of personality will be in the room. And what I have prepared as part of my sales process is all the things that each personality style will need. So if somebody is a visual person and they want to bring me in for a virtual magic show, I can talk about what I do, but I can hit a little button and play a little video to show the reactions. I say, look, if you're going to hire me virtually to entertain your group, here's what it'll look like. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. So now that's part of my sales process is I've got this video loaded up. And if someone is like, well, what does it look like? Are people really impressed? I can hit the button and right away they're impressed and they need that. Someone else might need something different. I can pull that up. I've got all these things ready for my sales process based on the personality style of the person I'm working with. The, The next thing I do is whenever I finish up a Zoom meeting, there's often people who aren't there. And this is whether they're booking me virtually or in person. But I ask them, hey, who wasn't here today? Who's one of the decision makers? And then either in the last two minutes of the meeting when we're together, I film a little recap for the person who wasn't there. Smart. And I get the wow. people who are in the meeting to talk to me. Like, hey, and I talked to Joe. Joe, right, you like this part, right? And Joe validates it. So now that person or people who weren't there, they get a video. It's short. It's quick. It's to the point. They have to watch the whole meeting. And I find out who they are. Oh, what do you? okay, who's not here? Janet, okay. Janet is important because she's going to help make the decision. She just sounds like she's a critical thinker. Tell me about Janet. Great. I think what we need to tell Janet is this. Let's press record. And now it's me and the people hiring me. We're actually now a team 
creating a video for their colleague or the boss wasn't there, um, adjusted to their personality style. So that's dude, that, that is that's freaking ninja level right there. That is crazy. That I've never heard anybody do that. That is nuts. That is awesome. The the virtual world has become an uh, unparalleled in its in our ability to um, stay connected. You know, I value in person relationships so much. But right now, part of my my you know my uh, karate, my kung fu, whatever it is, my my ninja moves, <laughs> is that before I ever arrive in person, I'm maximizing the use of the virtual space and virtual interactions and asynchronous communication and videos to raise anticipation, build excitement, and participation for whatever the in-person event is going to be. So I think there's un- there's just so much opportunity there. Uh, but back to your other question of, of how do you do this on stage, yeah. right? How do you become a better speaker on stage? And I'll, I'll, I'll add just one little simple thing because you're smart, people watching this are smart, we're all good at what we do, we know what we're doing, but all we want is those extra ninja moves. So here's the, the ninja move. You can tailor your speech and presentation to the different types of people in the room, providing statistics and facts for the analytical people, showing a customer testimonial for the people who are more emotional and want to feel they're connected to you. Um, But what's better, what's the ninja move is at the very top of your speech, you acknowledge who's in your audience and you tell them what each of them is going to get. Mm. And the act of acknowledgement, now the audience no longer has to guess, is there anything in it for me? Does he care about me? But in the beginning, it's, uh, let's say it's a technical audience, you know, hey, I know we have 100 software engineers out here, but we also have the marketing team. The -hmm. purpose of today's meeting is X. Today, I'm going to speak to you about Y and Z. I believe that the marketing team will get this out of it, that the technical team will get this out of it. And my hope is at the end of our speech, together we will do X. Yeah. That makes them feel acknowledged, seen, heard, and they know that you care and you've prepared for them. That's not a tactical change. That's like a a strategic framing of your speech that makes your audience trust you and feel great about the process. Yeah, it's so so good. It reminds me of when I was preparing for uh, talks is the TED Talks has a bunch of talking or TED Talks on how to give a great speech. And that concept framed a little differently was there. But it's like what you just did is you did the formation of an idea. You like gave them, this is the idea that I am trying to present to you. And then your talk frames up that and builds the idea, but they're all focused around one centralized thing. And you just framed it to them at the very beginning. I never thought about it that way, that you're just literally in the beginning of your talk, literally framing, here is what you're going to get. Here's the big idea. Here's the thing for you marketing. Here's the thing for you engineers. And then you walk through over the next 20 minutes or whatever and build that in. And, and saying, and those of you that may be skeptical, and those of you that may be excited, <laughs> and those of you that, that may be guards. curious, yep. you, you're, you know, that's what, to me, mind reading is, right? We're getting close to mind reading using technology. M- magicians have always been ahead of science in that we create the illusion of what science eventually creates as reality. Mm. And right now, magicians have been obsessed with mentalism and audiences are obsessed with mentalism because I believe it's because we're getting very close to technology allowing us to read minds and, and transfer our thoughts without speaking them. So my job has been just to create the illusion of it. And, and the illusion of it, I think, correlates to a really fundamental human need to, to see and be seen. And when I can make my audience feel acknowledged and heard and understood which I truly do because I love them, I care about them, and I want to know about them, then everything else starts to really fall into place, starting with that foundation. Mm. So it's, it's not magic. It's, you know, it sounds like, uh, oh, you're, you're body reading, you're doing these secret things. I'm just really paying attention to people (laughs) and, and knowing what they need. That's, that's so awesome. good, man. So many people don't do that. Pay attention. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> that's super important. Uh, Kosia, before we, um, or I was going to say, we, we often ask people kind of how they overcome hardship here on the show. You have a, a super unique story in that you went from this journey from Soviet refugee. We haven't even talked about this yet, uh, all the way to the TV stage. Talk a little bit about your journey uh, and how that's, you know, uh, developed, you know, your skills of overcoming hardship over the over the years. Certainly, it's, it's the, the, the foundation of who I am is that I am a Soviet refugee. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, 
and my family uh, fled as refugees to America in 1992. Came here with, you know, $50 per person and two pieces of luggage per person. My parents in their 40s starting their lives over for the sake wow. of their children. But but we knew what the Soviet Union was. We knew what Russia could be and now is. And we wanted to get away from that. And and so my, my growing up in America was built on this foundation of here. You know, my parents gave up everything for the sake of their children. Nothing's going to be provided for me. And so I've got to work to create what I do. And, and I was just lucky enough to get into magic. And when I saw magic and started doing a few shows here and there, when I was 14, 15, 16, people would say to me all the time, they'd say, you're so lucky to do what you do. And I hate my job. I would love to be a magician. And I learned when enough people tell you the same thing to listen. And I thought, God, all these people hate their jobs. They're telling me I'm so lucky. Maybe I should continue doing this. And so, so as a teenager, you know, again, 17, 18, 19, 20 and starting college, I was okay with being a starving artist at that time because I knew that's, that magic made me happy. Um, and once I accepted that, my business started to slowly grow up, up to the television appearance, which made that grow even more. But uh, to me, it's this foundation. I think that's what drives me as an entrepreneur. And it's strange not having two children, wanting to provide for them, but thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, the reason I had this drive as an entrepreneur is because I knew I wasn't going to have any. No one's giving me anything. <laughs> so That's so true. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I talk a lot now with, with other business owners about how they raise their kids, how they made them appreciate the hard work and all the things that they do because you want your children to work. You know, yeah. even well, you we, Luke and I them. came from similar, you, yeah, we were talking about this on the podcast anything. before, you know, grew up very, you know, not well off. But, yeah. but My uh, dad was a pastor, so he... Yeah, like, you know, or still you go. Is, how do you do that? How do you then, you know, he didn't your... make any money. Yeah, yep. yeah. The, people can give me different solutions. You know, one thing is, of course, is to to raise them to be helpful. You know, even though if you may be successful, you're well off to, to show to take them to other places around the world. I, I've been told a lot of different solutions. I, I I don't know if any of those are. I don't know. I think anything anything comes close to living a difficult life, even if it is for a few months or years. And having that be a part of your psyche, that, that's yeah. what ends up driving you. So I don't know if there's a substitute. That's why, you know, after a certain amount of generations, wealth can fade away because a third generation down doesn't appreciate what they've got. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm barely the first generation, so I'm still working on it. I'll yeah. let you know. <laughs> so good. Now, Kosti, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate you sharing your story and your insights from a business perspective. Before we close out, let people know how they can connect with you. I know you also, your wife has a book that you wanted to mention. Yeah, absolutely. This is magic related. And if anyone's got kids who are fascinated by magic, she wrote a kid's picture book, a rhyming story. David Copperfield wrote the foreword to the book. He read it. He loved it so much. Wow. And it's about a young, uh, it's, it's so cool. You can see his foreword. You can see it on the Amazon page. Her book is called Hocus Focus, Practice Focus. And it's all about practicing and focus and determination and showing that magic is a skill, just like singing and dancing, that is difficult. And, and people learn through mistakes. And uh, so it's a wonderful, beautiful story with a great surprise, magical twist. Uh, you can go to Amy Kimlat, that's A-M-Y-K-I-M-L-A-T dot com, or you can find it on Amazon, Hocus Pocus, Practice Focus. And you can find me at Kostya Kimlat, that's K-O-S-T-Y-A-K-I-M-L-A-T, or thebusinessmagician.com. Awesome. So if you've got any meetings, anything I can help you with, reach out. Well, we got, we got to see one magic trick or something. You yeah. Know what I mean, get people yeah. to check out the YouTube video. We, we got to have like one. I love it. Let's, one. let's do something. We'll send people. Yeah. Go to the YouTube channel to see more of the magic that I do. For me, it's all about being experienced live. But when we do something fast like this virtually, we can do something fun. Um, I, I have one of uh, a copy of one of my favorite books. This is Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. Okay. And this is a type of thinking that I use in my magic as well. I won't go into the details of the book. Anyone can, can search for it. But I'm going to use kind of the system one thinking here because I'm going to put you all on the spot. So let's try this real quick. I want you to think of uh, a simple shape, like a square or a star. Circle. Okay, But don't think of a square oh, cool. star. Uh, think of, in fact, each of you and everyone doing this at home, think of two simple shapes. <laughs> yep, got it. Yep. Think, of, think of two simple shapes, okay, and put one inside the other in your mind, okay. or you can draw it. And I'm going to draw here what I've got. Josh, Luca, tell me, what were you thinking? I was thinking of a triangle inside of a circle. Dang it, that's what I was thinking like that, of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What were you thinking of? I was thinking of a triangle inside of a circle too, yeah. 
triangle inside the circle. And I'm sure that your viewers who will now post in the comments of the video, many of them will say the same exact thing. I put you on the spot. I got you to think a certain way that I wanted you to think. Let's try it in a different way. I want you to think of um, a two digit number, okay? Make both numbers odd and make them different from each other, okay? okay. So like not okay. like 11, but 13 would work or 97, something like that. You got a two digit number, both numbers are odd, different from each other. Yep. Okay. Yep. Who, who was thinking of 37? Oh, I had 57. I, I had 53. 57? 50, I had 53. Okay. No, no, that's totally okay, yeah. because again, in the comments, in the sections, you'll see how many people thought of either 37 or 35. When I put you on the spot, I limit Oh, Ethan's thinking. nodding along in the back, no? Oh, okay. <laughs> good, good, we gotta hit there too. No, no, we yeah. will. It's simply, it's simply numbers, but let me take it a step further. Let me combine the two. So Josh, I'll have you do um, the symbols, the suits. Luke, I'll have you do the numbers, okay? And yeah. what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a pack of playing cards, and I'm gonna take one card out for you all. And uh, not that one, this one, yeah. I'm gonna place it in the other way, okay? So there it goes, I won't show you what it is just yet, but I will slide it into the box. And now we'll combine your thoughts together and we'll see if I can influence you that way. So um, right now, if I think, tell your viewers to name any playing card, most of them will say the ace of spades, Okay. okay? System one thinking, you're under pressure, you think of what's most common, you think of something that's been in musical lyrics, things like that. Me telling you that right now changes your perception already, it changes your thinking. So Josh, I want you to think of either a spade, a heart, a club, or a diamond, mm -hmm. okay? And Luke, I want you to think of a value, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It can be okay. uh, a jersey number, it can be a day of the month, it can be something meaningful. Now we're taking system two thinking, a little slower, a little deeper, a little more emotional, and you're gonna think of a number, or a jack, queen, or a king. It is playing cards, so it's your choice. Both of you have that in your mind? Yes. Yes. Fantastic, all right. Luke, what is the number that you are thinking about, or the value? A uh, jack. The jack, perfect. And Josh, what is the suit that you were thinking about? Club. The club. So this is the cool thing about this, right? Is that before we started, I took one card out, I had you think two different thoughts, and you two did exactly right. <laughs> get get <laughs> right out of here, man. Get done. out of here. Freaking me out here, guys. No. You got to go watch this YouTube video. If you're listening on audio right now, he just literally did that in front of us. That was nuts, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, magic is just such a, a beautiful art and it's a way to get people excited, energized. But I, I found that the real value when I'm done presenting isn't just about, hey, you fooled me or it was fun, but it was about the thinking and how transformative it can be to think like a magician. And it's not about lying, cheating, and stealing. It's about perception. It's about realizing that we all have the power to create reality for other people. Mm -hmm. And we do that every day, whether we realize it or not. So being conscious about the way we craft the effects we do, the reality that we create for others is very transformative. And, and I speak to businesses, but I know that on a personal level, it's also something very applicable in your personal life to be able to see from the eyes of your spouse, of your children, of your friends. It, it makes us more honest with ourselves when we do that too. It's I so love it. good, Coasty, thank you so much yeah. for again for coming on, and thank you all for listening. You can get those links that he mentioned at staypaidpodcast.com. So we'll place his website there, his wife's website, and also a link to get that book on Amazon. Thank you so much for listening. You can dive deeper to this episode and get those notes over at staypaidpodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want to show your support, head on over to Apple Podcasts, drop us a five-star review along with a comment. We'll read it here on the show, and the best way to show your support is simply to share this episode, share this YouTube video, with a friend. If you want to get hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com. And of course, you can follow us on social media. We are at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, I'm Luke Acre. Just amazing. That was awesome. It got me really thinking outside the box. And that's really the challenge of uh, what you're giving to people is to think and put yourself in other people's shoes. I think that is one of the best action items that people can do. But I also think, guys, that what you should work on for this show, right, is think about, okay, you're going into listing presentations. You're going and meeting people at these networking groups like how are you determining their personality type and what they need from you and apply what you learned today on the temperature and the speed right the speed of how the person is talking to you and the temperature of how they're doing it and remember the difference between top producers and mediocre producers in every business is top producers take action so take action on that today 